La impartirá Sheldon Lee Gla eh, Glashow y lleva por título A Parable of the Pure and the Practical, the Need for Basic Scientific Research. Sheldon Lee Glashow obtuvo su doctorado eh, por la prestigiosa Universidad de Harvard en 1959. Ha sido profesor de las universidades de Stanford, Berkeley, Harvard, Houston, perdón, Houston y actualmente la Universidad de Boston. Ha realizado estancias en el CERN de Ginebra, en el MIT, en el Texas eh, A&E, eh, su producción científica supera los 200 artículos que acumulan más de 27.000 citas, contando tres de ellas más de 3.000 citas. Junto con Steven Weinberg y Abdul Salam, desarrollaron la teoría electrodébil por la que ganaron el Premio Nobel de Física en 1979. El modelo electrodébil es una teoría física que unifica la interacción débil y el electromagnetismo, dos de las cuatro fuerzas fundamentales de la naturaleza. A su vez, este modelo se haya incluido en la teoría eh, de gran unificación que une la interacción electrodébil con la interacción nuclear fuerte. I will now ask Professor Sheldon Lee Gliso to address the audience. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm glad we finally found the slides. Sorry for making you wait. Uh, this is the first time I've had the great pleasure to talk uh, on this island. I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to give a very non-technical talk, unlike my predecessor, Alvaro. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about why we must pursue basic scientific research. Uh, and this is a talk that I will be giving actually in Mexico, about 10 days from now, at a new institute for, uh, basic, for, for basic science to be created in, uh, in, in Chiapas, in Mexico. And I will be giving it again in Vietnam at a new institution being created in Vietnam. Uh, let me proceed uh, with the issue. The issue, a couple of slides I will read, Many representatives of government, industry, and academia argue that government should invest only in research that is likely to generate immediate and specific benefits, either wealth creation or improvements in the quality of life. They find that undirected research in particle physics, or in mathematics, or in cosmology, low temperature physics, many other basic sciences uh, to be useless and expensive luxuries that consume resources rather than promoting economic growth and human welfare. And I'm devoting this uh, talk to uh, demonstrating that they are wrong. The thesis that I will attack uh, comes from a letter to The Economist magazine a couple of years ago, uh, which goes as follows in part. Fundamental physicists, they say, would be hard pressed to point to anything useful that was directly dependent on their theorizing. Uh, Alvaro's lecture was an example of uh, the search for something entirely useless, he would agree. The discoveries of particle physicists or cosmologists are intellectually irrelevant to almost everyone. Does it matter how old the universe is? Does it matter if matter consists of two different particles or 17 different particles? If individuals wish to contemplate the universe, let them do it in their spare time at their own expense. It is far more important that we encourage our best brains to solve real problems and leave theology to the religious professionals. Uh, this is not something I agree with, yes? So, uh, we come to the antithesis. And uh, this is often said, had Faraday, Rankin, and Hertz focused on solving the real problems of their day, we would have waited much longer for electric motors, x-rays, and radios. Remember that when Rankin uh, did what he did and discovered x-rays, he called them x-rays because he had no idea of what they were, x for the unknown. 
when he was asked by the press why he had done this, he said he didn't know, he was curious. He was playing around. In a very short time, of course, uh, x-rays became medically important. It is true that today's fundamental physicists are concerned with exotic phenomena that are not at all useful uh, in themselves, like Higgs bosons. Nonetheless, their work has made and continues to make an enormous impact on our lives. And that's what I'll be talking about today. We shall demonstrate how curiosity-driven searches for fundamental knowledge have proven to be at least as useful, at least as effective, as direct searches for solutions to specific societal problems, whether from the discoveries themselves uh, or from the frontier technologies they required, or even from the skills developed by the people uh, in the course of these discoveries. But our critic does have a point, and let me say a few things about CERN, uh, uh, since uh, uh, I'm a fan of CERN, just as uh, Alvaro used to be an employee of CERN. World premier research facility for high energy physics. Supported by 20 member states with 2,500 full-time employees, CERN hosts, as you heard before, 10,000 visiting scientists from 113 different countries. Uh, and among its accomplishments, let me simply review some of its many accomplishments. It found the neutral currents of the electroweak theory which uh, I sort of that was excited by that because I had a certain parietal interest. Uh, it used neutrinos to confirm the quark hypothesis. It discovered the W and Z bosons, again, a couple of my favorite particles. Counted the number of different kinds of neutrinos. By the way, the answer seems to be three. It created the first anti-atoms, anti-hydrogen atoms. Uh, and it discovered the Higgs boson last year. And the point is that none of these triumphs are likely to contribute anything at all to human health or wealth. So is it all useless? Uh, well, almost, I have to agree, but not quite. And let me uh, digress a little bit about CERN. CERN is a hotbed of innovative technology. Technologies involving accelerators, cryogenics, detectors, electronics, information technology, uh, superconducting magnets, material science, superconductors, etc. Through licensing or joint ventures, CERN makes these resources available for others, for scientific or commercial purposes. Just a few examples of spin-off. 1965, it created the World Wide Web by scientists and for scientists but other people seem to use it too. Uh, in 2004, uh, it introduced a simulation software uh, that is now widely used in physics, space science, medicine, and radiology. It's called JON4. In 2003, a, a spin-off company uh, spun off by some of the people who were involved in the discovery of the Higgs boson, uh, and this spin-off uh, involves an advanced kind of uh, X-ray uh, system which makes use of the energy of the X-rays in addition to uh, their position. It's, it's a kind of sophisticated new development. And in 2012, I now quote from Forbes magazine, a business magazine from the United States, Quote, thanks to scientists working on particle physics at CERN, the Geneva International Airport is the proud owner of the largest solar energy system in Switzerland. And this was a spin-off from the vacuum technology that had been developed for the purposes of operating the Large Hadron Collider. Despite these relatively minor spin-offs, although I don't think the World Wide Web is so minor, uh, the, CERN's primary purpose, let us remember, is to pursue the secrets of nature and to train the next generation of innovators. But now let me go on to uh, the many virtues of basic science. And uh, I think I don't like sitting down. Uh, here I have a, uh, a list of some discoveries, some fundamental discoveries. Each of these discoveries uh, earned a Nobel Prize, incidentally. 
Uh, X-rays in 1894, we mentioned that, uh, led immediately to uh, medical technology, but uh, more recently to CAT scanners, which use X-rays in a sophisticated manner. Uh, 1932 was an important year because I was born in 1932, but uh, positrons were discovered in 1932, and they led to another kind of medical scanner, the PET scanner. And the third kind of medical scanner that you encounter at hospitals are MRI scanners, which depend on the discovery of uh, nuclear ma magnetic resonance, NMR it used to be called. Uh, and that was discovered at Harvard by two of my teachers, by Bob Pound and, and uh, Ed Purcell uh, at Harvard University. And that discovery took place in 1950. Uh, isotopes were discovered, radioactive isotopes, in 1912, uh, and uh, many therapies depend on the use of radioactive isotopes. So these fundamental discoveries have had many, many practical applications. One of them saved my life because brachytherapy is a particular sort of therapy that's used for prostate cancer, which I once upon a time suffered for and was cured from. Uh, 1934, a cyclotron was discovered, and today there are thousands and thousands of uh, accelerators out there, many of them used for cancer therapy. One of the first ones used for cancer therapy was at, at Harvard in 1950, uh, when they showed how cancers behind the eye uh, could be uh, treated with x-rays. The previous therapy had involved removing the eye. Uh, in 1957, lasers uh, were discovered. Lasers are now used in microsurgery, for example, very commonly. Uh, they're also used in uh, so many uh, other applications, which I won't speak about now. Uh, PCR is a medical technology. Uh, that, uh, I don't care to try to reproduce uh, medical acronyms, but it, as it led to an, uh, the ability to read DNA very quickly. Hence, uh, you can tell if a uh, if a murderer really is guilty or if a person accused of murder is really guilty, forensic medicine uh, exists on the ba DNA-based medicine on the basis of discoveries made in 1986. Uh, penicillin, like x-rays, was a chance discovery. The, uh, it was fallen upon, and of course it has led to the control of infectious diseases. <laughs> The structure of DNA, uh, Watson and Crick and their friends, 1953, uh, has led to gene therapy. So here we have each of these fundamental discoveries uh, leading to something practical. It happens again and again, and I will bore you with two more slides uh, indicating this sort of thing. Radio waves were discovered in 1888. It didn't take long before Marconi made use of radio waves and developed wireless telegraphy. In 1947, holography was developed, and now we have a method, for example, of securing our credit cards. Transistors were discovered in 1947. All of a sudden, portable radios became truly portable, and we had the first computer revolution where vacuum tubes were replaced by transistors. And just a few years later, integrated circuits were discovered, a bit of fundamental physics leading to the second computer revolution, optical fibers discovered in 1966, rapid data transmission, uh, personal key cryptography was developed by mathematicians in 1976 for secure data transmission. It allows the, uh, the banks of the world to cause all the trouble that they have uh, caused over the years. Uh, the giant magnetoresistive effect uh, was uh, discovered simultaneously by a Frenchman named Fert and a German in uh, 1988. They won the Nobel Prize for it, and within just a few years, it made possible all of a sudden uh, the hard disks on our computers could carry gigabytes rather than uh, a few hundred megabytes, and there was an explosion of the size of hard disks. High T superconductors were discovered in, 18, in 1986. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we don't quite know what their applications will be yet, where some people are working on energy storage mechanisms using high T superconductors. Other people, many laboratories are struggling to find practical purposes. There will be many. 
uh, quantum manipulation. This uh, last year's Nobel Prize was given to a couple of physicists for Frenchman and a, an American for individual manipulations of atoms or photons. Uh, and that probably is relevant to the development of quantum computers, which will be another computer revolution someday, but not yet. Again, all but two of these things won the Nobel Prize. Uh, you can try to figure out which didn't. A last slide, uh, more fruits of basic science. Now, I, I love this entry at 1839, the discovery of the photovoltaic effect, that when you shine light on certain materials, you produce electrical currents. The discoverer was the grandfather of Henri Becquerel, the person who discovered radioactivity. But it was a family that did many other things. Uh, and he discovered that photovoltaic effect, which is the technology underlying solar panels, which are now used to uh, reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. The photoelectric effect, discovered in 1905, uh, led to the development of charge-coupled devices, which in turn uh, led us to uh, digital cameras. Uh, X-ray diffraction was discovered in 1912, that's what let us understand the structure of DNA many years later. General Relativity, 1916, the triumphant discovery of Albert Einstein, uh, without which we would not have GPS and we would all get lost when we try to visit our friends on holidays. Uh, nuclear fission was uh, discovered in uh, 1938, uh, thereby correcting a fundamental error that one of my heroes uh, Fermi had made, Fermi thought he had discovered elements number 93 and 94. He was so confident that he had discovered elements number 93 and 94 that he named them Osonium and something else. Uh, but, and the Nobel people in Stockholm were convinced that he had discovered elements number 93 and 94, and they gave him the Nobel Prize for that discovery in 1938. Uh, which had to change because in October or so of 1938, the nuclear fission was discovered and it was realized that Fermi had made a big mistake. But he deserved the Nobel Prize, and he took it as well. <laughs> in 1949, carbon dating was developed, and I just read in, whoops, interesting stories about carbon dating uh, showing uh, that uh, es establishing that it, it has never been uh, as warm as it is now, going back several million years. Uh, 1969, charged couple devices led to digital cameras. 1984, buckyballs, fullerenes. Uh, yesterday, I uh, saw a uh, beautiful lecture by one of the students here about uh, surrounding fullerenes, buckyballs with, with rare gases. Uh, that's not exactly a practical application. There aren't very many practical applications of buckyballs yet, but I'm sure there will be. And graphene, everybody goes around, physics departments around the world are all uh, saying that graphene is going to be what plastics were in the 1950s. The future is in graphene, they're telling us. Maybe they're right. Anyway, so you can see uh, that there, again, all but one of these discoveries won a Nobel Prize. It's easy to tell which one didn't. In 1839, there weren't any Nobel Prizes to give. Pretty impressive. Anyway, uh, how atom smashers became big business. And uh, this is sort of an interesting story. Uh, cyclotrons were created, uh, of course, uh, by in the States uh, for uh, pure research to study the basic building blocks of matter. And I remember uh, the cyclotrons would get uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, one of the uh, first cyclotrons, the first cyclotron that Harvard had, uh, was, was put into a big box and shipped off to Los Alamos. Uh, to help in the, uh, in the Manhattan Project to build atomic bombs. But uh, it is my understanding that the box was never opened when it got to Los Alamos. Uh, the next cyclotron at Harvard, uh, which was there when I was a graduate student, 
was built at just the wrong energy so that it was useless for physics. And that's the one that was used for medical purposes and which was one of those that began the, uh, the, the concept of particle beams as a medical therapy. But today, there are 30,000 accelerators in operation, and almost none do fundamental research. Uh, yes, there's the Large Hadron Collider. Yes, there are a few medium-sized accelerators that are still doing what might be called basic particle physics. But mostly, they're used for industry or for medicine. They're used for ion implantation. They're used for material processing. Uh, they're used for therapy. They're used for producing isotopes for medical use. Uh, they're used for irradiating food to kill germs. Uh, they're used for non-destructive -dest uh, industrial inspection. Uh, they're may, they're, they're neutrons are used for looking for hidden bombs. Uh, there are many uh, purposes for using accelerators. Uh, energy loss due to synchrotron radiation. Now, that, this is a, a technical problem uh, at accelerators, that when you try to make electrons go round in circles, which is what people like to do, uh, to do basic physics, they, they lose energy. And that was a problem at the beginning. But that problem has developed into a, a million dollar, multi-billion dollar bounty, because synchrotron light, the light that electrons spit out in fact, it was my thesis advisor, Julian Schwinger, who first analyzed this light. This uh, synchrotron radiation, as it's called, is a very useful kind of light. And uh, there are a number of dedicated machines, about 70 of them around the world, large, expensive, sophisticated exper uh, devices, the most impressive of which uh, uh, one of them is in Japan. It's a very beautiful and impressive facility. Uh, they're deployed all over the place in 20 different countries, and they are essential for industrial re research. Uh, they're building big, well, bigger ones uh, as well. So uh, these accelerators, these atom smashers, uh, are awfully useful for us. And they let us find things like W bosons and Z bosons and other useless trash like Higgs bosons. Uh, but they do have some other important purposes, should be remembered. Now, just uh, to get an idea of how long it takes uh, between an idea and the realization, the industrial realization of that idea, just a couple of examples. So uh, GMR is the giant magnetoresistive effect. And I, I know a lot about it, even though it's not in my field of enterprise, uh, because I was involved in a, as a friend of the court in a, in a big lawsuit having to do with that discovery. But in any case, uh, between the discovery of the giant magnetoresistive effect and the development of gigabyte, gigabyte hard drives, it took only three years. It was one of the most rapid uh, industrial developments of, of which I'm aware. Uh, from the development of charged coupled devices to, to their implementation as digital cameras, uh, it took just six years, again, quite quick. From transistors to transistors radios to the commercial deployment of commercial radios, seven years. From radio waves from, from uh, Mr. Hertz uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, uh, who was it who, who developed the wireless, uh, it took 11 years, not much time at all. From fission to, to nuclear, from fission to bombs took seven years, from fission to commercial nuclear power took 19 years. From general relativity to GPS took 78 years. So nobody was hustling Einstein back in 1968 to say, can you invent something that would let us uh, help us know where we are on the face of the Earth? He would have laughed at you. Uh, but he developed general relativity, and now we have GPS. Uh, photovoltaics to solar panels, that's the extreme. That took 115 years to, to develop. The latency period can have many causes, among them necessity. I mean, it's only today or in the last 20 or 30 years that we've discovered that we are in the process of destroying our planet uh, through global climate change and global warming. And uh, we need uh, to extract energy from the sun. We need solar panels. Uh, war, of course, led us toward nuclear power, stopping off with bombs on the way. 
uh, missing technology, uh, you couldn't develop GPS upon the discovery of general relativity. A lot of other things came first, including satellites. Uh, uh, so uh, there are various forces involved that uh, delay uh, impl technical impl implementation of fundamental ideas. Uh, things happen by chance. People fall upon various discoveries. Research must be done with eyes wide open. La chance ne se rit qu'aux esprits bien préparés. Uh, this has many uh, uh, implications uh, that even industrial scientists have to keep their eyes wide open. So I have my five short stories. The first is very short. Once upon a time, a prince searched for a needle in a haystack. Instead, he found the former's, farmer's daughter, and you know what happened then. Uh, in 1856, young Henry Perkin, he was 17 years old, an Englishman, uh, he uh, was given the task of synthesizing quinine, uh, which he could not do. It was not done for almost another century. It was done uh, by Americans at the time of the uh, Pacific War, the Second World War with Japan, when we needed quinine. Uh, but he tried to synthesize quinine from the destructive distillation of uh, coal. And uh, instead, he made an extremely smelly, disgusting substance, which is roughly what I would make as a high school student when I try to destructively distill coal. Uh, he made a stink. But he saw that there was a slight purple color to the stink, and uh, he discovered a dye which he named, or the French named, mauve. And he became very wealthy uh, because the mauve dye, mauve dresses were worn by the Queen of England and also by the Empress of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Napoleon III, uh, Eugenie. Uh, and uh, he became very, very, very wealthy indeed. Uh, he gave up his business and went back to being a, a basic scientist after he made his first fortune. In 1896, Henri Becquerel, the grandson of the guy who, who led the technology for solar panels, set out to prove his fascinating theorem. Uh, he, this was two years after the discovery of x-rays. And he convinced himself that the sun uh, must produce x-rays. And so he set about an experiment to prove that the sun uh, produced x-rays simply by taking a piece of photographic film and wrapping it up in black paper and putting it out in the sun. And uh, he, he actually, uh, no, no, he's not the sun that makes x-rays. Sorry, I'm saying it the wrong way. That luminous materials produce x-rays. He, he had convinced himself that luminous materials produce x-rays as well as light. Now, many things are luminous. Uh, the particular stuff that he used uh, was a compound of uranium. It didn't have to be. There are many luminous things that are not radioactive. Uh, children have these little things they wave around on holidays. Once you break them and they shine and they make lots of light, they're luminous, but there's nothing radioactive about them. By accident, he had used a uranium compound. He showed that it uh, exposed the photographic film after it was exposed to the sun. Uh, he had convinced himself that he had discovered that luminous materials produce x-rays uh, until he realized that he had done something much more interesting. He had discovered radioactivity. Completely accidental. 1965, uh, there was a chemist someplace who was told to, to uh, test the efficacy of an uh, anti-ulcer medication. Uh, and they, uh, a, a, well, in the process of uh, producing that material, uh, he happened to stick his fingers in his mouth. And he discovered that this chemical was very sweet. It is aspartame. It is one of five different artificial sweeteners that are used. Each one of those five. Uh, saccharin, cyclamates, aspartame, a couple of others, uh, were discovered by chemists who were looking for quite different things. Uh, each of them managed to stick their finger in their mouth at the wrong time, well, what turned out to be the right time, and accidentally uh, produced saccharin, cyclamates, aspartame. It's, uh, even that 
chlorine derivative of sucrose, sucralose, uh, that some people use. My advice is stick to sugar. Uh, in 1996, chemists at Pfizer uh, held clinical trials uh, with you know, third degree, the, the high level clinical trials for a new drug to treat hypertension or angina, and the trials failed. They, the drug had no effect at all uh, on angina or hypertension, but it had a, a kind of unanticipated side effect on men, but not on women. <laughs> Guess what they discovered? Viagra. Completely accidentally discovered. Uh, so uh, even if you're working at an industrial facility, you've got to keep your eyes open because you might discover something that you weren't looking for, like the farmer's daughter, which can be a very happy thing. <laughs> uh, international scientific collaboration. Uh, you know, CERN is a wonderful organization. It's so international. Countries that hate one another uh, collaborate. Uh, we, we heard that there, there, that there are North Koreans involved in uh, there. there. There are uh, all sorts of uh, countries, for, uh, people from different parts of the Middle East that don't care for one another very much. Nonetheless, they work together at CERN. Uh, basic scientific research is among the few areas where in nas nations of the world do cooperate. Modern science emerged as a multicultural endeavor. I can give many examples, but the classic one is Copernicus, a Pole, Tycho Brahe, a Dane, Kepler, a German, such as Germany was at, in those days, Galileo, an Italian, and Newton, an Englishman. Uh, those five nations, men from five nations, uh, taught us our place in the heavens. Now, admittedly, uh, those five were all white Christian European men. Uh, but today, of course, everyone can contribute, men, women, black, white, green, and purple, uh, to the scientific adventure, regardless of their nationality, religion, race, or sex. Among many international collaborations that exist, I just mentioned a few. Uh, the, uh, uh, my buddy Sam Ting at MIT has uh, created the, the enormously expensive Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is up in space. It's a collaboration among 16 nations. The International Space Station itself uh, is a, uh, represents a collaboration of 15 nations. The International Linear Collider, which does not exist but has been designed, uh, involves a collaboration of 19 nations. Uh, ITER, the so far remarkably unsuccessful uh, uh, international organization to further the goals of thermonuclear research, uh, involves the European uh, Union plus six nations. And CERN, of course, CERN uh, is the most international of them all. And here, uh, if you want to see all the countries that have some involvement at CERN, here they are. Uh, in red are the member states, but there are lots of other countries involved at all. These, these are the, the ones that have some uh, sort of formal contact uh, with uh, CERN. Well, apparently, that does not include North Korea. Anyway, you don't want to read that. Uh, physicists, I said at the very beginning that uh, there are various kinds of uh, spin off. You can spin off uh, technologies, but you can also spin off people. And uh, there are a number of, I, I, I could go on for a long time, I'll just uh, indicate a few. Uh, people who have spun themselves off in one fashion or another. Alan Cormack uh, was a nuclear and particle physicist. He was the chairman of the Tufts, long time chairman of the physics department at Tufts University. And uh, really, in his spare time, uh, he invented the CAT scanner or the technology underlying the CAT scanner, for which he won the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1979. Uh, he shared it, actually, with an English physicist uh, who also uh, worked out the technology of the CAT scanner in his spare time. Wally Gilbert was a uh, student of Abdus Salam, with whom I would sh much later share the Nobel Prize, with Abdus Salam, that is. Uh, and then uh, Wally came to Harvard as a junior fellow, uh, and he was a uh, physicist he was an assistant professor uh, in the physics department while I was a graduate student, and he uh, became an assistant professor. He taught 
uh, a course which I could barely understand. He became a <laughs> rather well-known physicist based on a few uh, incomprehensible papers that he wrote, uh, most abstract possible physics, until he got interested in biology. So he switched, as many physicists have done, uh, to molecular biology, and he made some uh, really fundamental discoveries in molecular biology. Uh, consequently, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1980. Uh, meanwhile, he was, became the co-founder of a major pharmaceutical company, Biogen. Uh, he became very wealthy. He became a philanthropist. He gave a wing to Harvard University. Uh, and uh, then he, uh, aside from being a rich philanthropist, he has become, a, has a new career as a photographer. He's a rather r a renowned art photographer. Now that's quite uh, a uh, variety of interesting things for a physicist to do, spin off. Paul Ginsberg, uh, I wrote a couple papers with him when he was uh, uh, assistant professor at Harvard. I uh, never got tenure there, uh, but uh, what he did uh, is he got, well, he, he taught me how to use a computer in the limited sense in which I can use a computer. I'm not very good at it. Uh, but he developed the archive that has been mentioned before, the physics archive, uh, by which uh, all of the, whatever is done in my field or most other fields of physics, becomes instantly available uh, openly to anyone in the world, including North Korea, uh, 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 at, uh, immediately, with no cost and with no thieves involved uh, picking out money, the hard-earned hard money of physicists uh, to publish their, their, their uh, articles. He won a MacArthur Genius Award for changing how physics gets done. Leon Lederman, oh, well, he's real famous, he discovered well, the, the second neutrino and the fifth quark, uh, that, that since there only are six quarks and three neutrinos, it's a pretty major contribution to find one of each. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize, uh, and uh, he got into STEM education, that is science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, those are things that Americans don't know how to teach their children. Uh, and uh, he worked very hard at improving science education uh, in Illinois. In fact, when I was once upon a time on stage with Ted Kennedy, uh, Ted Kennedy, who was our senator at the time, uh, he came to me and said, he, Shelley, he, he, he seemed to be on a first name basis with me. I certainly would not call him Ted. But he said, Shelley, why don't you do for Massachusetts what Leon has done for Illinois? And I don't know, I didn't, I, I, I'm not that good, but Leon did wonders. Uh, Andrei Sakharov, I, I, I can't begin to tell you the wonderful physics that he did, but he was also a champion of human rights in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Peace, although of course he wasn't allowed to pick up the prize. Uh, he, he led his government to sign the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty with the United States before that treaty, both the uh, Soviets and the Americans were blowing up bombs in the atmosphere and polluting the world terribly with uh, radioactive materials. Anyway, he was succeeded in doing some really remarkable things outside of the abstract and useless discipline in which he found himself. I have one last slide, and uh, which is a little irrelevant to my thesis, uh, but it it is, it, it is important to remember not only does basic science lead to new technology, but new technology is essential for basic science. It's a two-way street. And uh, for example, steam engines uh, were invented long before anyone understood how they worked. Uh, and it was the, the existence of ste steam engines, it was the existence of the, uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution that challenged physicists to develop the science of thermodynamics. Uh, 19th century inventions uh, of spark coils. The, a man you never heard of called Rumkorf uh, invented the spark coil, which was in every early automobile. Every early uh, in, internal combustion engine had a little spark coil. The, uh, the Model T Ford, I had the spark coil to a Model T Ford that I used for silly experiments that I did as a high school student. Uh, 
but it was the Rumkoff coil which developed high voltages. It was the accelerator of its time. Uh, photography developed by Daguerre and mercury air pumps by Geisler made possible many of the great, greatest of discoveries at the turn of the century. Uh, radio waves, x-rays, radioactivity, the electron, atomic number, and cathode ray tubes, all of those developments uh, were made possible by the work of engineers. Uh, the antenna that was used by Penzias and Wilson to discover the cosmic background radiation, which was our big clue uh, uh, as to the reality of the hot Big Bang, uh, that was built for AT&T for the earliest satellite communication. They had uh, launched a very primitive big balloon as a satellite and were sending signals from California, bouncing it off the balloon and receiving it in New Jersey to demonstrate that there could be such a thing as satellite communication. And the device that was used for that was the antenna that would be used to discover the secrets of the universe. Uh, after the uh, Soviets signed the test ban agreement, uh, the Americans didn't trust them. And uh, they probably didn't trust us either. But we uh, launched satellites for the specific purpose of verifying whether the Soviets were exploding uh, weapons uh, in space, in, in, in the atmosphere. And they, they never did violate the test ban treaty. However, uh, they, very strange signals were detected by these satellites, but they weren't coming from Russia. They were coming from outer space. And they remained sort of secret for years until they were released to the public. And uh, we discovered gamma ray bursts, which are <coughs> extremely interesting things that very few people in the world understand with the exception of Alvaro Durucola, who's sitting right in the front row, will tell you anything you want to know about gamma ray bursts. Uh, supercomputers enable otherwise impossible calculations in pure science and in applied science. And in fact, just to give one example, the famous four color theorem, the, the fact that any uh, map, any ordinary map, of, I say ordinary because the countries have to be simply connected, but that's a technicality. Any ordinary map needs only four colors. Actually, when you buy books of maps, they need five colors because there's a constraint. Water has to be blue. And if water has to be blue, you need five colors. Anyway, the four color theorem in mathematics uh, required supercomputers to prove. And they were the first uh, pure mathematics theorem solved with supercomputers. And now there are many, many problems uh, out there, both in mathematics, in physics, and in engineering that have to be addressed with uh, supercomputers. So those are just some examples of how the street is two ways, how not only does, is basic science essential for technology, and not only must we defend ourselves against those who would uh, insist that basic science be directly connected to the market, nothing in my mind could be quite so obscene as that requirement. But let us also remember that technology makes basic science possible. Thank you very much for your attention.